Uh, welcome back to my video blog. I'm back talking about my painting of the Battle of Trafalgar. But first, the stuff in my window. Uh, I'm calling it a video blog. I don't know uh, if that's what it is. Is there like a criteria that has to be met to be considered a video blog? Oh, look at the light that's uh, falling on it. I'll close my... Uh, here we go. Since you were last here, I added a schooner. And I've added some signal flags. I'm just putting those in. Today's uh, Thursday, the 14th of January, 2021. We just impeached President Trump yesterday. Um, what I did was this morning I photographed the uh, work I had done up until yesterday. So here's the, here's the painting this morning. And in my view, it was too empty over here. There is a weight... The, the complexity and the different tones and everything and the textures draw your eye over here and there's very little to draw your eye back over here there's a school of thought i have always like this notion that we read from left to right so the sentence would start here and we'd read the words and the school of thought is that we look at a painting that our eye enters it from the left subconsciously we can't help it according to this theory and moves across it um, i believe that theory is true um but that's kind of neither here nor there. I discerned that I needed something over here, right? I had a choice. I could have cut the whole canvas, cut 10 inches off the right-hand side and restretched it, and I'd have a fine composition, right? Um, but instead, I decided to put the schooner Pickle. Pickle is the name of the schooner that was there at the Battle of Trafalgar, and she became quite famous because she later on was the, the ship that was the fastest and was given the task of delivering the news of the Battle of Trafalgar back to England. So she got celebrated. And in fact, there was a painting made that included the pickle, and this is called the Dodd Pickle, because the name of the painter was Dodd. And as soon as the news of the battle came out, it was a sensation, and England went crazy, and he did this enormous painting, and this is just one little detail of it, but that's his version of the pickle. And so this could be considered a contemporary source on what the pickle looked like, and, uh, you know, I am trying to be accurate, right? So I'm looking at the sources and trying to determine. Here's, um, this is a model kit that's for sale that you can buy of the pickle. And you'll notice there's a few differences. If you're a real nerd, you'll notice that the Dodd pickle doesn't have a uh, martingale or dolphin striker. And the model does. And that's an example of one of those things where people just will always argue. I'm not sure that in my, you know, painting that the pickle is going to be the proper um, shape mainsail, you know. I am reefing it so that the sails would be a little lower, I guess, than they would be when it was a nice sunny day. But it, this is a painting depicting bad weather coming in. Um, so this is actually the third time I'm taping this one because I keep trying to talk about where I place the pickle on the picture plane. This is The, the picture plane is the whole image, right? And then there's a horizon line that always goes across the picture plane, right? And that is always where your eye is located. Like if, if you were this tall, you'd be standing right here and your eyeball would be right alongside the horizon line. The things that are farther away get closer in this direction towards the horizon line. And the things that are closer to you get this way so that if there was like a cork bobbing right here, your eye would tell you that's in the foreground. And if it's right on the edge, it would look close enough for you to reach over and grab it, right? So where I placed the uh, the ship where it touches the water, this is a water line, right? But it's also, it's, it's showing the eye how far this ship's hull is from the horizon. And you'll, you'll see that the ships that are farther away are closer to the horizon this way, so that this one's the farthest. And this one's closer to this ship, but still pretty far away from this ship. And then I wanted to place the pickle into this same piece of sea between here and here. Maybe that's like 400 yards or something like that. I was going to place the pickle. So the pickle is supposed to be a little closer to the Uralis. And the pickle is a very small ship. So how big I make it on the canvas, how, how much uh, real estate it takes up, right? Let's assume that the, the water line stays the same, but I, I, I paint everything bigger. The eye is going to tell you that this is a bigger ship then, 
right? If I move it closer to me um, and zoom in on it, like the pickle becomes bigger and bigger, it's not going to be realistic because after a while the pickle will be bigger than the Euryalis. So if, if I put the pickle on the same line, if they shared a similar water line, the same straight imaginary line across parallel to the horizon, if I brought the pickle to that line, I'd have to make the pickle bigger, and then it, I'd be going back to the scale of this thing. Like, it, Let's assume that the pickle's 50 feet long. Uh, I'd have to have uh, whatever 50 feet equaled on this, which might be from here to here. That's how big the pickle would have to be on this line. But if I did the same thing and put the ship next to the, the much, much larger 74-gun ship, this hull would have to be, from this size, shrink down to about this size alongside this ship. Right, so what does it matter? It, what, what I'm getting at is, this loca is the location of this line, the imaginary line where the pickle's actually resting. It has to be on the right... Uh, level, the horizontal level, which on a map you would call a uh, a line of latitude, right? Uh, a, par a line parallel to the horizon where the pickle lands will kind of determine how big the ship appears to the human eye looking at the painting. So while you, when you're a maritime painter, you have to decide where the horizon's going to go, and then you have to place your ships you can place them wherever you want, but you are constrained about how big they appear based on where they're placed here. And uh, I've been trying to become a maritime painter now for several years. I think I'm becoming successful at it, but I haven't gotten a lot of feedback. Um, but I'll tell you that in the earlier days when I was trying to do this, my intention, my, my instinct was to always place the horizon line up higher. And so I was like up and looking down at the water more. And I thought this was going to make it easier to paint the ships and get the space in between the ships. Instead of getting the crucial zone between here and here, where if I make a mistake of a quarter of an inch, I'm really changing the scale of the, sh of the, of the schooner. If I have the horizon look higher, I get more real estate to play with. And so in my original paintings, I was putting the horizon up pretty high. But then I noticed every time I worked on the painting, um, they weren't successful, and I was trying to fix them. And so I would go back and paint them a year later or six months later, and I would always wind up changing the horizon line. So I'd leave the ship where it was on the canvas, and I'd move the horizon, usually down. So then that led me to look at the existing paintings of other um, maritime artists, that are you know in the museums and you can see them online and the horizon line is often like at this point near the bow like it's it's very rarely up here in relation to this the ship it's usually down here which means that the viewer is down here like the viewer all these paintings from the old days are done before photography could have been taken up into the air by an aircraft so the point of view of these ships was always from a vantage point that was only a few feet above the surface of the water and then that would determine where that horizon line fell. So this is a lot of talk about horizon lines. Um, but I was also trying to you know, work in the idea that I was going to add balance by putting this ship here, the pickle. And I think I made that clear. So um, this is eight minutes long. The other ones, went, like I said, this is the third time I'm doing this tape. Um, I like it shorter better. And I will now put the camera down. But what, the next time you see me, I'll be working on this canvas some more. But I hopefully will have the pickle much more realistically painted in. Right now it's quite crude. And the, the signal flags. The signal flags were really the purpose of ships like the pickle and the schooner. Um, I'm sorry, this, <laughs> this isn't a schooner. The pickle is a schooner. This is a frigate. And although it's armed with cannons, at the Battle of Trafalgar, these smaller ships were not in the line of battle. They were um, there to pass along messages. And before radio, you could yell as loud as you could, or you could fly flags. So these flags all have a different meaning. And uh, in different combinations, you could spell out words. Or if you had code books on each of the two ships, you could have um, you know, a book that would say, like, flags number 8, flags number 12, and flag number 16. If I fly those like this, that means 
I have this message to tell you. And it, you would just look it up in the booklet, and it would tell you what it was. So they were coded. And then these ships would be visible to the bigger ships farther away, and the flags would be large enough they could be seen through a telescope. And so the, the next point, if you're a maritime painter, would be trying to figure out what the flag code was in 1805. And that has proved to be difficult. There is a, um, there is a code called the Popham Code. Um, Hugh Popham was the first guy to actually like just make this you know, mandatory throughout the the Royal Navy. And the Popham Code is supposed to have been used by the Royal Navy in 1805 when the battle took place. But then I've seen in ships' logs, they'll say they're they're hoisting these signals and they don't correspond to the uh, Popham Code. So <laughs> I'm doing the best I can here. But this one won't really have a uh, translation. It's going to be, um, uh, what this says is like, this this flag tells you that the following flags are the code. So then these will be numbers. So whatever the code book says would be the actual message. And I chose them because of the color. I just wanted as much red as possible because the painting is so like overwhelmingly gray, blue, you know, grayish colors for the sky, blue, green colors for the sea, and then some yellow and these earth tones. But there was no red except for in the, in the ensign. So that'll add some color. And then I'm going to make a point of making the same signal arrangement on the schooner, showing the viewer that these guys are repeating a message that is supposed to be seen by another ship farther away. And that was the beauty of the system. Like if I can't, if I can't see anybody waving a flag over here, I can signal my flags to a nearer ship. And then he raises the same signal. And then this guy can see that one, right? And then he raises the same signal and then this guy finally gets the message. And that's how they communicated back then in 1805. And it actually worked at the Battle of Trafalgar. They had a chain of uh, frigates and smaller ships that were up in close where the enemy was in Cadiz. The enemy French and Spanish fleet were in a harbor. And the British fleet was at sea hoping to go to war. I mean, they wanted to have a fight with that, that those ships in the harbor. So it was all about understanding when your enemy was going to leave the harbor and then you could pounce. And um, it was the frigate Euryalus, this one, who was sending signals from close in shore back to Admiral Nelson and the fleet that was out of view of land. But there were a chain of frigates and smaller ships that were in view of each other. So, like, if the enemy was on a tower at Cadiz, they'd see one or maybe two enemy ships. But they couldn't see the entire fleet that was off over the horizon in the distance. So, including the signal flags in a painting like this is um, is good because I'm trying to keep this series of paintings I'm doing this this winter in the spirit of this what, let's call it the shared universe of the Battle of Trafalgar. So this is you know an indeterminate time before the battle itself takes place, but these are ships that will be in the battle. So this is October in 1805, but I'm not sure what day it is. But it's I'm trying to be that specific. I want to be as accurate as I can, including the ships that were there, and trying to make the ships look as close as I can to what I can learn that the ships that were there actually did look like. And that's proven to be a lot of research and and reading, and, and that's fun too. This video blog is more about the painting aspect of it, but it all comes together in the Battle of Trafalgar. And like I say, I'm going to do more of these paintings this winter, and I'm building up to what would be a much larger painting where the ships are actually firing with cannon and there'll be smoke and everything. And, you know, but I'm kind of like working up to it a little bit at a time. So I hope you'll keep following my video blog as, the two, as all of us together um, go into the Battle of Trafalgar and paint it. <laughs> all right, that's all I got for you today. Thanks for watching.